Hello, everyone. Hey, that's about the enthusiasm as, as uh, about the enthusiasm I expected on a Friday afternoon. Like the, the, the look. <laughs> Thank you, Alina. So, uh, you, everyone had a nice week this week. See, still the same level. I know it's been a difficult week. We're all a bit tired, but we have about 50 minutes left, and then the conference is over. So, I'm going to do my best to make it a very uh, enjoyable and impactful session for you. So, welcome. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is a toolbox. It's not just any toolbox, it's your personal toolbox. So we all kind of have one. And the idea of the toolbox is that it contains all the knowledge that you have gathered over the years, all the experiences, all the tools, frameworks that you know. And whenever you encounter a new problem, or a new challenge, I should say, <laughs> uh, you need to grasp into the toolbox and find something to hammer out a solution for that problem. Now, we need to keep that toolbox up to date because the world is constantly changing. And to make that really concrete how dire the situation actually is, I wanted to talk to you about Half-Life. So uh, I see a few, like, nice. So uh, does anyone know what Half-Life is? Yes. It's a game. What is a Half-Life? Does anyone know what that is? Yes. Alina, since you're speaking up so loudly, you can explain to the audience what a Half-Life is. Yeah, so Alina says it's the nuclear thing, that, and it means the time it takes for uh, yeah, something to, yeah, to decrease to half its initial value. But it's not actually a nuclear thing, it's just a term. A half-life is the time it's required for something, uh, for a certain quantity to reduce to half its initial value. I've seen some of you at Beer Central this week. The half-life of a beer is pretty small in the city. But there's also a half-life on your knowledge, and that's where it gets a bit tricky. So the half-life of your relevant IT knowledge is actually the time it takes before half of what you know becomes irrelevant. Because when I first started in IT, all of the things that I learned then are just <laughs> no longer used anymore. Does anyone want to wager a guess how long the half-life is of relevant IT knowledge? Three to five years? Three to five years? Less? In JavaScript, like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> In JavaScript, two weeks. That's a good one. <laughs> so as everything IT, in IT, of course, it depends. But uh, what I found in some research is that it's actually two to five years. And this is really creepy because uh, in Belgium, at least, the formal education to become a software engineer is three years. Three years. And after two to five years, half of the knowledge is already gone. So that isn't good. And I'm pretty sure that you've all felt this pressure to, to stay up to date, and it's getting really difficult to embrace this lifelong learning. So what I'm going to do in this session is going to give you some tips and tricks, uh, just some concepts, uh, methodologies, that will help you to work on your lifelong learning. So that's my promise. By the time you get out of this session, we have 46 minutes left, you will be better prepared to deal with lifelong learning. Sounds like a good plan? It's Friday afternoon, I know, but we're going to do our best. Not afternoon yet. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Close, close. I know some people are already like wanting to go to lunch. I get that. <laughs> but we're still going to go into this. So I have four things I want to talk to you about today. And the first thing is finding the right thing to learn about. And that sounds pretty pretentious, like I'm going to tell you what, what to learn about. But in honesty, IT sometimes feels a bit like this. You're just faced with a wall of information right in front of you, and how do you even choose what you're going to learn? How do you even choose what you're going to focus on? For me, it's a little bit like walking into a bookstore and seeing all these interesting books, but you have a limited amount of time. You can't read all of them. And just like the, uh, in the same concept, you can't learn everything in IT. So what can you learn? Like, what's your, what are the things that are more important to learn? Now, like, if you expect a concrete answer from me, I can't give it to you because it depends on your context and what you already know. What I can show you is some models that can help you think about this. So what you should know about me is that before I got into IT, I got my teacher's degree. So I am uh, legally allowed to, in Belgium to teach uh, IT. So uh, in case you're not impressed yet, that's Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. 
please clap. Thank you. <laughs> wow, it actually works. Cool, cool. So, but one of the more important things in the teacher's degree is that they actually teach you a lot of things about learning and teaching. And this is one of the, mo uh, the most simple models that actually had the most value for me. And that's the zone of proximal development by Lev Vygotsky. And it's that simple, and you're going to think, wow, is this DevOps level content? But we'll see. Because the concept is simple. Right in the middle is all what you already know. So that's the knowledge you already have. Then you have a thin layer around it, and those are the things that you're capable of learning at that point of time. And then if you go a bit further away from what you know, from what you're really good at, then there's things that you just can't learn yet. And I'll give a very concrete example because this is a little abstract. And unfortunately, it's about uh, front-end technology. <laughs> If you know HTML styling, so you know that on an HTML element you can add a style attribute and then you can add some styling, then probably you can also learn CSS. Because it's a really small step to go from HTML styling to CSS. So that's in the circle of things you can learn at that time. What's probably in the outer circle is CSS animations. Because to do CSS animations, you first need to, do, need to know about CSS. And even though this is a really simple model, I see a lot of mostly junior developers struggle with this because they want to learn something that's the outer circle, and then it doesn't work because that it's just too far away from what they know. And then they come and say, oh, I'm too stupid for this. Maybe I'm not good enough to be in tech. And that's awful because it's just you made a small mistake. It's, it's not a big deal. You can, you, it's okay to say, I don't get this yet, and then you can work together with someone to see, okay, if CSS animations is where you want to go to, then what's in this circle that can help you expand a bit? This is a very simple model, but I honestly believe that each and every one of us should keep this really in mind whenever we try to learn something. And even better, I don't know who of you are lead developers or uh, steering a team. A few? I'm going to be really honest, I expect you people to know that about your teammates as well. Because if your teammates are struggling, chances are that they just have this wrong. Or you, you, you assign them a task that's just outside of their comfort zone. And you can help them a lot by giving them more insights in, okay, you know this, okay, then what are the n valuable next steps? And then when you're in, in school and university, your teachers do this constantly. They're constantly aware of, okay, we showed them this, then what's the valuable next step that's feasible? But we should be introducing that into our companies as well. So lead developers, that's up to you. It's a simple model, but it works because of something else, and that's cognitive load theory. Who knows about cognitive load theory? Not that many people. Okay. I'll give you a short introduction. Um, so the idea is that your brain can only hold a couple of items in memory. So let's say we are, we're, we're in an IT conference. So let's say it's the RAM memory of your PC. You can equate it to that a little bit. And uh, research has said that it's between five and nine things that can be in memory. Recent research is shifting those numbers a bit. But in this example, let's say it's seven. You can have seven things in your working memory. So what's going to fill up that working memory? Well, there's a few different kinds of load. So that's things that are going into the memory. And the first one is intrinsic load. And intrinsic load is filling up that working memory basically with the task at hand. For example, when I ask you to, uh, to multiply 2 times 2, I hear 5. <laughs> I know it's Friday, it's been a long week, but... No, when you multiply 2 times 2, it's almost 4. Like it, it, your brain isn't stressed by that because it's a really simple thing. So the intrinsic load of that task is really low, so it doesn't fill up that much. When I ask you, hey, uh, please write me a differential equation to send stuff to the moon, that's intrinsically a way harder task. So that's how your memory kind of gets filled up. Then there's something else, and that's extraneous load. And that's basically load that your brain gets because of the instructional techniques that are happening. I don't want to uh, trash talk any of the other speakers here, but if you've ever seen a presentation with like a lot of different animations and things spin and it makes you a bit nauseous, that's extraneous load you're feeling. Because it has nothing to do with the content, it's just about how the content is being presented to you. 
Another example of extraneous load is when the font is too small on slides, because then you're focusing on trying to read it, and all that energy that you're spending on trying to read it is energy that your brain can't spend on actually learning the things that is being explained to you. So we have seven of those slots, they get filled, but then you have to ask yourself, yeah, but Java is not one thing. We can do Java, so how does that work? Well, there's a little bit of a hack, and that's this. Sub-modules, like sub-tasks. Ooh, nice. So what does this mean? You it can have uh, uh, all these slots can be filled by new ideas that fills an entire slot, or you can have a concept of multiple ideas together that will also only fill one slot. And those concepts, for example, the concept of the programming language Java, is one thing. Where does that come from? It's your long-term memory. So whenever you're able to save something in your long-term memory, it creates these connections. And if you have this, uh, and they call it a schema. And these pre-existing schemas, for example, the programming language Java or writing a class, I mean, writing a class doesn't take much energy anymore once you've done it a million times. Because then it's in your long-term memory, and it just whoop, doesn't take as much energy. So it's really valuable to have on this side in your long-term memory, useful things that can be reused a lot, that have a lot of value for you, doesn't matter what you're implementing. So then a good question to ask is, and that was the original question as well, then what are good things to learn and to put in your long-term memory? This is a really important one to remember in, on that aspect. If you want to put things in your long-term memory, Remember that technical implementations decay faster than the concepts they are based on. What does this mean? I see a lot of junior developers, and I'm sorry, I'm being quite offensive to junior developers because we all suffer with this. Um, I see a lot of developers that want to learn, oh, I'm gonna learn Angular, I'm gonna learn React, I'm gonna learn, they're constantly jumping from JavaScript to JavaScript framework. But actually, if you look at the concepts behind those frameworks, they're not all that different. So it would benefit more, instead of jumping to framework and learning like basic hello worlds, to check what are the concepts that are in this programming language. Because those concepts you can transfer into new languages. And then it's like, ah, oh, but this is actually quite similar than Java. So do classes also work then? Oh, look. So you can build important things in your long-term memory that will be valuable no matter what you go do. So what are some interesting concepts? I have a short list, there's probably more, but if you know, if you focus on good oriented, uh, object-oriented programming, that's a skill that you can take to a lot of different languages. Functional programming the same. Good TDD skills will benefit you in whatever language you're, you're, you're going to learn or whatever project you're doing. So if you uh, work really hard to put these things in your long-term memory, they become easier, and that gives you a lot of value no matter what the task is you're doing. So if you're going to choose something to learn, do some of these things, because those are way more transferable between different tasks that you're going to be doing. TDD, uh, DDD, and uh, one I want to specify here as well, the design patterns. Because we say, yeah, design patterns, yeah, we use them, but whatever. But actually, if you know design patterns really well, someone can explain code to you in one or two words. You look like a, good, a, a big structure of code, but someone tells to you, yeah, that's a decorator pattern. And if you know the decorator design pattern, the code all of a sudden already becomes way more readable, because you know what the decorator pattern is. So, good things to put in uh, your memory. Now, I know that a lot of people struggle with, like, then or can't do it themselves, they can't determine what is the next step that I should take. And this is where coaching comes in. I expect this from lead developers, I expect to do, for companies to do this, but if you're stuck somewhere and you feel, hey, I need some help with this, there's a free website called codingcoach.io where people, volunteers, offer some of their time for free. Uh, for example, I do that for Java, and then there's mentees that come to the site and it's like, a non-creepy Tinder for like <laughs> career advice. 
you get matched, and then you just offer some of your time to these the developers and you help them out. So I was able to help out some people uh, in Africa that don't actually have access to like a formal education, and that's just really heartwarming. So if you're stuck, remember that there's always these kinds of platforms to help you out as well. So that's about what should you choose to learn. But then you still need to apply it in a good way. Because <laughs> you, you probably learned a ton of things here at the conference, but you've only seen it. You haven't used it yet. And once you start using it, you'll discover that there are certain little tricky things that aren't all that clear. So that's the next part, applying what you have learned. And the reason why we need to apply is, uh, this is from my teacher's education as well. I'm going to go through it. Uh, this, this is called Bloom's Taxonomy. I don't know, are there any teachers in the room? One? So uh, that, in the, that's a doubt. <laughs> Uh, so, this is the way they ask teachers to structure their lessons. And you start actually from the bottom. You help your students to remember some info. If you don't know that the word class means something in Java, good luck with applying it. Because <laughs> you need to remember at least some things. You also need to understand it. So that's like a next session or the next phase of the lesson. And then I'm going to skip to the top one. The top three ones, because if you look at the top three ones, creating, evaluating, and analyzing, this is what we get paid for. This is our job, these top three. And as you can see, right in between is applying. And I have the feeling that we sometimes miss the applying part of the learning structure. We, uh, we understand it, we remember things from a conference, and then we think we can immediately create a huge system using Quarkus, even though we've just seen Quarkus on a conference. We make uh, critical judgments saying, oh yeah, we definitely need event sourcing. Uh, <laughs> so this is the structure we need to follow. So the thing here today is called learning through tinkering. So what is tinkering? It's just experimenting. It's experimenting, experimenting with ideas uh, just to understand how it works a bit better. But then I had my colleagues that asked to me, hey, Tom, like, <laughs> all nice and well, but what do you do to keep up to date? Like, what are some kind of projects that you've used to, uh, to update your knowledge? So uh, today I'm going to show you four of my pet projects. It's a lot. <laughs> it's really a lot to show four more projects in Friday afternoon. So uh, I can tell you all code is online. You can dive deeper when you want to. I'm just going to show you some basic concepts, and I'm going to tell you about my experiences and the lessons I learned while doing these things. And the first thing is really limiting yourself. Because, as I said before, uh, if you're anything like me, you're really enthusiastic about code and about new stuff. And you have the impression that you want to go home with all the things that you learned, and you want to apply them all at once. So maybe some of you are planning to go home and make a pet project that contains uh, Quarkus, that you've never used before, uh, Debezium, which you've never used before, uh, maybe do some event sourcing, maybe do like a lot of different things. And I see a lot of people make the mistake of, oh, I'm going to make one pet project just to remember everything that I've done here. But that's actually not that good if you look into how our brains worked, because it just triggers too much cognitive load, and that hampers you're studying, actually. So you should try to limit uh, what you're learning to one thing at a time. And the way I tried to do that was with a small project that's related to this. Anyone know what this is about? A weighted companion cube. A weighted cube. You're an expert because you said weighted. <laughs> All right. So uh, I decided to make a small project. It's uh, this one. And the way I tried to limit myself was I decided I was only going to do Java and I'm going to focus on the physics part. So I'm not going to use any cool, fr cool framework like Unity because then I'll need to learn C Sharp and mm, I don't want to. Uh, so I'm going to build something in Java. So, uh, okay, that's looking good. So to build a game, you need two things. You need an engine to like draw and make some logic happen. And then you need the physics. For the engine part, I actually found online a nice framework. Well, a, a description of a framework. It wasn't a framework. It was more someone who described how you could implement that. And he, uh, the, the person who wrote it, basically listed a few interfaces. Come on, open up. Just a few interfaces like this. 
That's all the blog post said. And then it did something amazing that you see in academics a lot. The actual implementation is up to the reader. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, no, no. But what I decided, like, uh, this was really cool because you could actually see that uh, I was taught in school a lot that you need to program to an interface, not an implementation. So that means that you can structure your interfaces up front and then choose your implementation later. So I decided, you know what, uh, I'm going to use JavaFX and I'm just going to like, build a small game. The second thing you need is, uh, is physics. And physics, I'm really bad at. But I found a website called The Nature of Code. Has anyone ever heard about that website? Only one person? Then I'm going to quickly. It's a book by uh, Daniel Schiffman. If you know him, it's from the Coding Train uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, he takes the train part seri seriously because he has like a whistle that goes toot toot. <laughs> uh, anyway. And he has a, his entire book about physics is actually online, and he explains in detail with JavaScript examples, if I can find one. Come on, come on, come on. Explain, explain, explain. Uh, it doesn't seem to be loading. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to waste too much time on this. So he has a full explanation of how you can model uh, physics in code. And I basically used his example, and I transformed it into Java. So my one thing I wanted to focus on was just Java, and not really get too deep into other details. So what does that look like right now? Let me just run uh, the, the perfect example right now. Give it a second to boot. Ah. So that's it. So you can see I've implemented some gravity. It starts pulling the cube down. So how does that work? You actually need three things. So every item, every object in the game has three things. You need a location. So my location is now here. I'm stuck. I'm not moving. The velocity is how fast you're moving. So now my velocity is kind of constant, but it's changing my location. And then acceleration is just how fast, uh, how much you're speeding up or slowing down. These are the three things you need. And actually, in a loop, all that happens is the update here. Let me just hide this one. What happens on each game loop, so it is constantly looping, your acceleration, so how fast you're going, determines your velocity. So that's how fast, well, how much you're speeding. And then how fast you're going actually determines your location. So that changes constantly. But then the question is, yeah, this acceleration, then how does it change? Well, it's because of forces. Not <laughs> the force like Star Wars, because I'm always wondering, use the force. It's like, what force? Because you have gravity, you have wind, you can use kind of different forces. So all that happens is on each object, you can apply a certain force. So what does that force look like in my example? It's gravity. And I have this. Ta, 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 ta. Uh, it's here. So this is the, the entire game logic. I have something to, when you press the space, it moves the cube up again. If uh, the companion cube, CC, uh, collides with the floor, it stops falling. And you can apply a force, in this case, gravity. Now, if you learn about physics like this, you can see that the code is actually really, really clean for what it's doing. Because when I first started to implement physics, I was manipulating the x and y axis myself. And that became very messy. But if you learn about this domain a bit, you can actually improve how you implement uh, such things. So uh, let's add an extra force, because it's really easy. I have just these things here. So it's an x and a y. And uh, of course, gravity pulls you down. So that is the y axis. But we're going to go for wind that blows to the side. Uh, let's just say 7.5 wind. And all I need to do now is to apply that force. Now let's just do this and then uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. apply force, wind. And now let's, uh, let's run it again. Uh, let's see how the, the wind is going to impact it now. So 
So, too much wind. <laughs> but the cool thing is, because it's modeled now in a really, uh, because the domain was really clear, you can model it in a way that this is actually easy to change. Remember when you tried to do the X and Y manipulations yourself? When you have something like this, good luck refactoring it, because you don't really know what's, what's happening. Well, because this force thing is a variable, I can easily change it like this. So way better. So limit yourself. I'm pretty sure that I was only capable of building this because I did it in Java. And not because Java is my programming language or because Java is the only language you could implement it in, but because that was the limitations I set on myself. If you want to learn something, really only choose one thing. For me, it was I want to build a small game. <laughs> And I want to do it with as many things that can help me to build that game. If you're, uh, for example, if you want to build this in another programming language, I would still uh, make sure that you do it in your main programming language first, and then see if you can translate these concepts into the language that you're actually using. And that's my main gripe with uh, frameworks like Unity that do a lot for you. It's not in Java. <laughs> And it's just too much mental effort for me to both learn how games work and a new programming language. So take this advice along. Whenever you go home later today or when you start experimenting, make sure that you don't take on too many things at the same time, because it will really hinder you instead of helping you. Second advice or second uh, thing is reflect. I know we're all passionate people, else you wouldn't be here in DevOps. So I have a question. Who of you has a graveyard of GitHub pet projects? <laughs> Quite a lot of hands. <laughs> Do you have any clue why you stopped? Why you stopped working on it? You do? Yeah. I tried to do too much. You tried to do too much? Yeah, I tried to build a game engine with C++, which I never coded in. <laughs> Great idea, right? <laughs> Are you joking with me? Because that's what I just showed her. Is that actually the case? <laughs> so he tried to build a game engine in C++, which he didn't actually ever coded in. So apparently my slides are relevant. That's good. That's good to know. But what I want you to do uh, is uh, if you, you should really reflect on what you uh, have tried to learn. Because we, uh, as uh, software developers, we have this thing called sprints in Scrum. And at the end, what do we do? We have a retrospective, where we look back, what could we have done differently? Why aren't we doing this when we make a pet project and decide to quit? There's a lot of valuable information you can learn from that. Maybe it's something that just didn't interest you and that's why you quit, but that's good career advice. Anyway, I wanted to show you my example. Because as I said, I was a school teacher. Uh, I have my teacher's degree and I actually never went to teach at high schools. So I immediately got into tech because code is more fun. But uh, I work at a company called InfoSupport, and InfoSupport has uh, organized a Java miner in the Netherlands, or at least they used to. And what is a Java miner? Well, it's me teaching a group of students uh, a whole semester of Java for 30 ECTS credits. For those people who don't know what ECTS, what ECTS credits are, it's basically a semester worth of content. So that's everything from Hello World to microservices in Spring Boot to monitoring and so on. I had a nice class full of students, but there's one thing that I really hated every morning, and that was taking the attendance of the students. Because, uh, you know, uh, who's here, yeah, raise your hand, blah, 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 boring. So I decided to automate that. And I had two things. I decided to put a camera on the door. This was pre-GDPR. Uh, it was not illegal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I found uh, a... The, uh, uh, basically an API in Azure that does facial recognition, so you can dump the images to uh, them, and then you can send a REST call with the image, and then they send you back who was in the picture. But there's a problem with this, because on the one hand, I have a camera, which has video, which is a stream of images, and on the other hand, I have an API that expects single images. And it would be highly ineffective and quite expensive 
to send every frame of the video to cognitive services. So what did I decide to do one evening? You know what? I'm going to use OpenCV, which is software that can do some video manipulation. And I thought, cool. I, spent, uh, uh, I had to teach the next day, but I was still awake at 3 at night, uh, trying to get this to work. I was testing it on myself. I was super happy because it worked. And I was like, OK, next day, students, no longer raise your hands. Just come in, and we'll see if the thing works. And I was super excited, uh, as you can tell now. But then one student came to me and said, uh, yeah, it's not picking me up. Like, uh, I, I can see you're here, so <laughs> the, your attendance is OK, but the software wasn't picking you up. And I actually like it when things like that happen, because it's a good learning experience for the entire class. So we took the class together, and we were looking at, like, what, what, what's wrong? Why isn't it working for this person? And we couldn't really figure it out until we said, you know what, forget about the camera. We're just going to feed an image to the machine learning model. And uh, 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 OpenCV, but I forgot to mention, OpenCV is video editing software, but it actually comes with a pre-trained machine learning model to recognize faces. So whenever OpenCV recognizes the face, only then do I send it to the API. That was a, an important thing to mention. So let's forget about the video stream. Let's just immediately feed an image to the machine learning model that I got from OpenCV, so I don't train it myself. Important for the rest of what I'm going to say. I did not train this myself. Because I found a stock picture, and I decided to throw this at the algorithm. And yeah. Yeah, that was a very painful moment, because I had a student right next to me, and I ra uh, had written racist software by accident, because I didn't train it. I wasn't looking wide enough. This still haunts me to this day, by the way. <laughs> uh, w whenever my manager asks me, actually, that's my reflection point. When something like that goes wrong, I was lucky that it was in a classroom. The student was still laughing with it, because he realized, like, you know, whatever. But if I could have had, this could happen to people in production. Like, oh, look, it worked, super exciting. We're going to put this machine learning model that we found online just in production. We need to be really careful. So this was my reflection. It's probably one of the worst things that could have happened. But when something like that goes wrong, please reflect on like, what, what should we have done differently. So when my manager asks me now, do you want to do something with machine learning? I say, <laughs> no. <laughs> No. No, I don't want to. Um, so you can reflect on this project, and this is an extreme example, and I say, I don't want to do machine learning at the moment. But if you look at your pet projects or like your hobby projects that you've done, th that, that can contain career advice. Did I like writing tests? OK, then maybe I should write some more tests. Uh, or, or go like deeper into uh, like test-driven development, contract testing, test containers, whatever. Then you can dive deeper into that. But if you don't like something, like you really don't like JavaScript, that's fine. The IT world is big enough. But then make sure that you take that into account. So reflect on things. Simple advice. Next, you really need to be conscious about your learning goals. Because our resources are limited. And to give you an example that's not mine is this. Does anyone know what this is? CERN, yeah, the CERN Super Collider. Does anyone know what they do there? <laughs> Smash things together. <laughs> Apparently, you don't need a Hulk for that. You just need a large ring around, yeah, just a large ring where they accelerate particles. And actually, one of, one of the best examples I've ever heard was, imagine it's uh, uh, like a bundle of Lego. You can't really see from the outside what the, the, the separate pieces are until you smack them together and they fall apart. They're doing that with the universe. And maybe uh, accidentally create a black hole that will swallow us all. But yeah, for science. Uh, but you need to be really, uh, they were really conscious about their learning goals because they had to ask for a lot of money. You can never build something like CERN if you're not conscious about, hey, we want to, l we want to learn this. Also, uh, and that has a, is a, a bit of a local joke, but something like CERN could never work in, in Antwerp because it's building a large functional ring. Uh, <laughs> Where things go fast, so <laughs> that ain't happening. 
So I couldn't do that, but I have something else. <laughs> I decided to uh, try to build Pokemon Go. It was the summer of 2016. It was a, a great summer, you know? Everyone was coming outside to like, uh, not talk to each other, but run, <laughs> run around like this. Uh, and I really decided, you know what? I want to see if I can make the back end. Because a lot of people were making like fake front ends for Pokemon Go. I wanted to see if I can make a back end that works better than what they were doing. Because the first weeks that Pokemon Go went live, it was a, a mess. A mess. And I thought, you know what? I'm, going to, I'm, I'm just going to try and see uh, uh, if I can do this. And then I made a mistake. I said, I found this website where they do some reverse engineering on Pokemon Go, which is questionable legally, but I was just looking at it, so I, I think I'm fine. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to spend half an hour just to see what they found, to see how it actually works, and then I can maybe base my thing on how it actually works. And then I learned a couple of things. For example, I found, I found this picture, and then you learn that Pokemon Go does not use JSON to communicate with the backend, but it uses something else. It only has one endpoint called RPC. RPC, remote pro tool. Huh? Well, isn't that like old age time things that we were doing? But apparently they're using uh, protocol buffers, which is a different serialization uh, method. And it's actually way faster than Java if you do uh, from a Java app. Uh, sorry, it's way faster than JSON. Because if you do a Java to Java uh, communication, this actually is way more efficient. Which is interesting to know because everything's JSON anyway. Another thing they did was they designed their own way to map the world. You know, we usually map the world in uh, latitude, longitude, but that doesn't scale well in a database because it's two variables. So they found a way to draw one large line through the entire Earth, and one line means you can index that line because it's one line, it's one number. Super interesting stuff. Now, Tom, what does this have to do with your talk? Absolutely nothing. But you need to be conscious about your learning goals. Now, if you have the feeling like, Tom, you're kind of betraying us because you're showing us these things and now you're not going deeper into it, I'm sorry, that's the feeling you have to force on yourself. Because these two things I showed you are real rabbit holes. And I, <laughs> I can tell you this story and I kind of need a prop for this. Because when I did this, I was learning. But I wasn't conscious about my learning goals. I went down all the rabbit holes that I showed you tonight. And the way it ended was my wife finds me at 6 a.m. in the morning with a blanket <laughs> behind my PC. Just, and she comes like, sweetie, like, what are you doing? It's, eight, 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 it's 6 a.m. And I'm like, I need to know how this works. <laughs> like <laughs> freaking out with a blanket. like, oh. All because I wasn't... Oh, it's, it's getting stuck. Yeah. All because I wasn't conscious about my learning goals. I spent way too much energy, which is precious because we have limited resources, we have limited time, and I spent all of it diving into rabbit holes instead of doing the thing that I actually set out to do. So be really conscious when you're trying to learn something. Keep it in mind. If you feel like you're going down a rabbit hole, write it down somewhere and come back to it later. Because I've been using protocol buffers at some projects now, but that's only because I came back to it later. So be conscious. The next part is, if you uh, like have tried something, you can always try a different approach. You don't have to invent a new pet project every time. If you have a pet project that you liked, and you're like, OK, I built something in Java, and now I want to try it in JavaScript, it's OK to build exactly the same thing in another language. Why? Because of the uh, limit yourself. You limit yourself to do one thing. And the one thing is either you change the domain or you change the programming language. So if you already have a pet project, that domain you can apply with a new language. And I have an example of that. Does anyone know what this is? A Todoro. So Todoro is from a movie by Studio Ghibli. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to make the thing that I already made. Uh, let's see. Open in. I should have known the shortcut for this. <laughs> That's not working, the arrow. Yeah. I have to assign a shortcut, Marit. Yes. So Marit will probably know because she's the JetBrains uh, <laughs> developer advocate. So. so I decided, hey, look, remember this game? 
Like it's the inverse of the portal, I can just make it jump if I click it. That's it. But it's all written in JavaScript, so that was a good exercise for me to, to try. Now uh, that quickly became boring because yeah, it, it works now. So. so I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could use something to control the game that's not my keyboard? Because that's already quite interesting. So then I ran into uh, this little project. I don't know, does anyone know about the Teachable Machine? Not that many people. Teachable Machine is a website where you can train a machine learning algorithm. And I thought, you know what? I could probably use that to train something, like, like some visual thing, to, uh, to control my game. But what would I use to control a game about, uh, with Todoro in it? Yeah, well, I'm a giant nerd, so here, here we go. So I decided I wanted to use this thing, Todoro, to control my game. So I'm going to train a machine learning algorithm using the plushie. So uh, how do you control a game? How do you make the Todoro jump? Well, you need something. So I'm going to detect two things. I'm going to detect arms open and arms closed. And let's say that he jumps when we, when we fly. You know, see, see? Arms. That should work. So we need to detect two things. Uh, we have the open one. And we have the closed one. And basically, we're going to train a machine learning algorithm by making a lot of images. And I'm going to lower this a bit so it doesn't pick up the background. And I'm just going to give a lot of examples by recording the toad row. So uh, <laughs> this is going to look really weird down there, but I need to kind of do this. <laughs> So it's going to record like a lot of examples of arms open. You see, arms open, arms open. There we go. So it's now created a lot of examples uh, with arms open. And now I'm going to do the examples with arms closed. So arms closed. <laughs> Zoom in a little bit, turn a bit, you know, arms closed is arms closed. There you go. Yeah. And then you can just click the train machine learning model. There we go. So normally training a machine learning, uh, I'm going to put him here so you can see him. So uh, <laughs> training a machine learning algorithm normally takes a long time. But what they do is they actually have a pre-trained machine learning model, so like a neural network. They cut the last pieces of the neural network. They put <laughs> new pieces to it. And uh, actually, you only train the last pieces because the rest is already pre-trained. So instead of waiting days, months, weeks to have a machine learning model, it's already done. And it has a tester, so <laughs> bye. Uh, let's see if this works. So Closed, open, closed, open, closed. There. So when I said that uh, we were going to use the project. Well, uh, I was going to build it in JavaScript. All the JavaScript code to implement this is in here as well. And you can uh, upload your model to the cloud. Now, uh, I see that I'm running out of time. So I'm just quickly going to show you what that would look like. Uh, if the so this is an example of what it would look like. You know how I hated machine learning? <laughs> this made it better. <laughs> it made it a bit more exciting. So sometimes, even if you dislike something, if you try an alternative approach, maybe that works for you. So even if you're stuck and think, oh, this isn't working, try something else, even if it's really silly. So I have uh, a few more minutes to close down the rest of the talk. And these are some uh, common mistakes and things that uh, I wanted to still show you. So one of the most common mistakes is, I've said it a couple of times, limit yourself. It's too much stuff. And it has everything to do with these circles. So keep those into account. Track them for yourself. Make sure that you know where you stand. Cramming in too much knowledge. That's a bit of a problem with conferences. You get so much knowledge at the same time, but maybe it worked for you in university, but it won't keep working to just keep adding new knowledge at the same time to get 
things into your long-term memory, you actually need to repeat them quite often and in, at different points in time. So try not to cram in too much things at the same time. A little bit of a gripe about Stack Overflow-based development, aka the copy-paste loop. Because what I see some teams doing is they, uh, or some developers, is they find the code on uh, Stack Overflow, they copy-paste it, and then they say, oh, I did it. Are you going to write tests for that? No, because it's not my code. <laughs> it is your code now. Like the same with the machine learning algorithm. Once it's in production, you can't make the excuse, oh, but I didn't train it. No, as soon as you copy something, it's yours. So whenever you copy something from Stack Overflow, uh, two things. One, it's now your code, so take ownership. And two, check for the other uh, answers as well. Because usually there's like a slightly different approach that just makes more sense to you. Make sure that whenever you copy paste something that you actually understand what you're copy pasting. Now, we're at the final part, getting the most out of your knowledge. And you've learned a lot during this conference, but how can you make the most impact? First one is share what you've learned. I would honestly be super happy if I don't have a slot here next year, not because I don't like it, but because one of you is going to stand here instead. Because uh, sharing what you've learned is super important. Not only because it helps others, but also it helps yourself. Because if you want to share something that you've learned, you actually need to know it pretty well, because you can't explain it otherwise. So you, this doesn't need to be big. You can go talk to your colleagues at the coffee machine on Monday about things that you've learned. That's already sharing. You can blog, make videos, whatever you want. But share what you've learned. Do some good. We as developers have something amazing. We can create stuff. And the stuff that we can create can be really valuable for others. So do some good. I know that when COVID broke out, uh, there was a lot of trouble of like mostly the elderly that couldn't connect to their uh, grandchildren because everything was too difficult, like passwords and security. So what we did in Belgium was create a bubblebox.be, uh, which was a, uh, a video com conferencing thing without passwords. It just had a link, and once you click the link, you're in the, you're in the chat. Security-wise, a drama. But at that point, at that point in time, it was enough for like uh, elderly people to just click a link and they could talk to their grandchildren. Security be damned at that point. So do some good. And most of all, be yourself. I mean, I'm very much myself. I'm a silly guy who does silly things. And that's the most fun you can have. Just have some fun. Be yourself, don't try to be someone else, and share what you, you, you personal are passionate about. So to conclude, I've talked about your toolbox. We need to keep it up to date. Uh, and you've been doing a good job here by sitting here. But be sure that you need to keep this thing up to date for the rest of your life. So who is responsible for keeping your knowledge up to, up to date? That's you. You are fully responsible. Responsible means if your boss isn't giving you time to study, go talk to them. Show them that this is necessary for you to do your job, and they should support you in that. So once more, the circles, it's what you know. There's a circle around it that you can learn, and then there's just something that you can't learn. And there's no shame in admitting that you're missing a step. Take a step back, and eventually you will get there. The reason why this is important is because of this. If you stay too much in your comfort zone, you'll get bored after 50 Spring Boot applications. Actually, the sweet spot is when you're one foot in like new territory and one foot in like familiar territory. And unfortunately, if you do too much of the outer circle, you end up in a burnout. And I've been there, no joke. So that was the talk for topics I wanted to discuss with you today. If you do one thing, it's my call to action to all of you, if you do one thing, uh, take something that you've learned at DevOps, doesn't matter what, and go tinker with it. Share what you've learned. Talk, to, talk at the coffee machine, talk amongst each other uh, right when we leave this session, but do something with it, because uh, chances are that by Monday you've forgotten 97% of what you heard this week, unless if you keep it up to date and keep talking about it. And I'll leave you with this. If hours and hours of Bob Ross watching him paint doesn't make you a better painter, then hours and hours of DevOps without ever applying what you've learned
doesn't make you a better programmer. That's a talk. So uh, two more things, two more things. Uh, the slides are online. Uh, I set my Twitter bot to automatically tweet it out as well. So if you follow me on Twitter, you have this, uh, the link as well. Uh, I try to help you today by sharing like things about knowledge and learning. Uh, and I hope that I've helped you with your lifelong learning. Uh, if you can do me a favor, please rate the session and provide some feedback because I like doing this talk, but if I can improve it in some way, let me know. And uh, as a special surprise, I do have some Belgian chocolates to hand out. It's not a bribe for the rating, <laughs> but feel free, to free, feel free to come up and uh, come say hello. Right? I wish you a safe journey home. <laughs>